Well, good morning, everyone. Everyone slept well. Everyone had a good dinner. Yeah, Lord. I am bright. Looks like we lost a few people, didn't we? We're, we're a little, little more sparse this morning. Okay, let's uh, let's ask God's blessing on the rest of our meeting, shall we? Father, again, we bow before you and we thank you for all the good things you do to us and for us and what you're doing with us and through us. And we pray that this will be a very meaningful and prosperous morning for all of us, that we will prosper in your word and in our knowledge, and that we will see a way to use the information to make us the type of individuals that you want us to be. We thank you for the opportunity to meet and gather from all parts of the country. And we know that there's so few, very, very few people who even have the interest to learn these things. So we thank you for those that have come here. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless each and every one of them individually for the effort that they put forth. We ask now that you be here in our, in our spirits and in our minds and help us to comprehend these things because we, we don't want to be here just to learn new interesting things but things that will make us better servants in your name so we thank you for this opportunity and ask your blessing on it in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Okay uh, one, one thing I would like to do is uh, recognize a, a few people uh, who uh, make our little operation go. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Larry Cupton. Larry, would you stand up? L- Larry is the, the, the man responsible for uh, putting together these Nashville conferences for, for the last, uh, I don't know, four years or however long we've had them. And uh, also, uh, where is Dr. Stola? Where is she? Is she uh, uh, Carol, stand up for us. Carol, Carol's been. Uh, uh, we uh, we affectionately call her Doctor Carol. Uh, she's a medical doctor, but uh, she's always been uh, helping out and uh, uh, a big part of our uh, uh, enthusiasm for these Nashville conferences. And I don't know if are, are all of you aware of who. Originated BibleTruths.com. You thought I did, right? Yeah. Wrong pale face. <laughs> it ain't the first time. <laughs> <laughs> no, our, our, our webmaster is Dennis Vogel. He's managing the camera back there. Dennis, stand up so everybody can see you. Yeah, let's see, uh, eight, eight years ago, uh, Dennis and I were friends going back, I don't know, 30 years. About eight years ago, well, actually nine years ago, I was starting to do a little writing, and I spent uh, the greater part of a year, I guess, off and on. I was working full-time, putting together my uh, Exposing Those Who Contradict paper, which at that time was close to 200 pages. <laughs> so anyway, but it was it was really pretty rough. And uh, uh, but I had sent Denny a copy. I think he lived in Mobile. I lived in Miami Beach at the time. And after he read it, he said, "You know, we got to do something with this." And I said, "What do you mean?" I said, "We got to do something with it. We got to get this out." So uh, then he. He conceived of a, uh, a website, and uh, and he came up with Bible Truths, which which we we couldn't get because it was already taken. So then we put a hyphen in it, and we could use that. And that, now we own both domains, so we own Bible Truths with and without the hyphen. We've also said some people want to buy it from time to time, <laughs> uh, and we tell them it's not for sale. Uh, but anyway, so Dennis Vogel is the one responsible for putting all of the material on the uh, on the site uh, and uh, formatting it, formatting it in such a way that most people with both old and new computers can you know get the most benefit out of it. 
and he also uh, uh, is in charge of our uh, discussion forum and so on. Okay, so we certainly want to give him credit for that. Okay, so I, I'm laying in bed about six months ago or whenever, and I'm thinking, meditating to God about this thing, and I said, there's got to be a way to show without going into all these, you know, isometric dating systems and formulas and, you know, calculating how much uh, uh, sodium is in the oceans and, and uh, at what rate is the earth uh, slowing down or the moon is going further away or the dust is accumulating on the moon and, you know, just all this nonsense. And it's all nonsense. They, they, they hear something like something is doing something. They say, oh, wait a minute. If we run that back a billion years, uh, then, 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 then it, would be, it would end up here. And it, it can't be, you know. But it's always uh, false assumptions, false premises, bad math, you know, uh, uh, pseudoscience. Uh, is all, every, I've checked out thousands of pages of material now. I know where I speak. They have nothing. They have nothing. But anyway, so it just it's like God put it in my mind. Impact craters. Because you don't know maybe where I'm going with that. But I knew in my mind Yes, impact craters. There are impact craters on the earth. There couldn't have been a global flood. And the earth has got to be billions of years old. That's Barringer Crater in California in Arizona. <laughs> that crater uh is about a mile across, a little more than a kilometer, and uh, they've dated that to 49, 49 to 50,000 years ago, and had the, 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 the destructive power of 150 nuclear bombs. 150 nuclear bombs. This is a small crater, okay? There are bigger ones. The one in Chicxulub in the Yucatan is about 150 miles in diameter and has a destructive power of 25,000 nuclear bombs. And there are bigger ones than that. And there are many more. Okay? <clears throat> so I have these rounded structures with a deep depression surrounded by a parapet of ejected stone and earth millions of tons of finely pulverized silica large quantities of iron globular shale balls randomly mixed meteorite material anomalies such as shocked quartz radiometric uh, datable melt rocks datable rather melt rocks plus the absence of any natural occurring volcanic rock in the vicinity the reason that's important is so that you just say, well, this was just this is an old dormant volcano. You know, no. Uh, prove that some of these structures were formed millions and billions of years ago. How so? Radiodate them. See, the rock melts contain uh, radioactive elements which were set in motion at the time of the impact. And all you need to do is find which appropriate method, and I'm going to go through some of those methods this morning, to use uh, to date the half-life and then figure out backwards how long ago it was that this structure fell. This one, 49,000 years ago. There are very few this early. Okay, There are almost none uh, uh, of any consequence. In, in the lifetime of any, any human being. There's a little one that hit in 1644 in the desert of Iran, Iraq. It's about the size of a backyard swimming pool. And that's 400 or 350 or whatever years old, you see. So uh, there, there, there's not, most of them are, are extremely old, okay? Now, had there been a global flood, so how does this prove there was no flood and that the earth is billions of years old? Okay, first of all, 
First of all, if you can prove there was no flood, then you've automatically proved that all the all the water laid sedimentary rocks around the earth were not formed by a flood. If there was no flood. Therefore, you have to count for how did those stratas get laid down one, two, and three miles thick if no flood laid water laid them down in you know, a one global flood at one time. And that will take you back automatically millions and billions of years. When you radiocarbon date, not radiocarbon, when you do radiometric dating on, on, on these uh, 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 melt blocks and so on, that will tell you when this impact occurred okay so had there been a global flood there would be no remaining surface signs left this one is only 50,000 years old and look at it looks like it could have hit there you know 10 years ago if there was a global flood for one solid year with currents of 150 miles an hour and and that the, the deep was broken up you know they think all the subterranean to water was broken up and the earth crumbled and crushed and mixed together miles of strata and the earth's crust what do you think would have happened to that crater it would be so disappeared you know you understand can you see that a global flood uh, uh, 4,300 years ago would have wiped out all traces of that uh, crater yet there it is there it is proof that there wasn't a flood 4,300 years ago in Arizona or that that crater would not be there now they didn't find but a half a dozen or a dozen such craters uh around the world you know until recent times that just stick out like that like a sore thumb but now they keep finding more and more and more uh, I told you that uh, Friday I visited uh, the impact crater at Wetumpke in Alabama well, that was only about 10 years ago I think that uh, it was at Auburn University or one of those the, the geology department got funds and so on and they did core drillings you know in the in the uh, uh, down from the parapet wall and, and established once and for all yes indeed this was an impact crater <laughs> and they dated it 83 million years ago that impact crater hit and the ocean was right there at Wetumpke they're not sure if it hit on shore or out in the water slightly offshore but right there is the dividing line and if you look at a topographical map of, of Alabama or, 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 or the United States, you'll see that, 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 that like it'll be in yellow going sweeping up there, you know, uh, toward Wetumpke, Montgomery, and they call that uh, the coastal plateau. That was all underwater. Uh, when you go back, uh, actually you go back maybe... Uh, a little further than that you know a couple of hundred million years ago and uh, the ocean went all the way through the center of the United States up into Canada and, and, and it, was all, it was a giant waterway uh, maybe um, uh, 800, 1,000 miles wide right through the middle of the United States that was all ocean at one time now so then we have these large ones like uh, uh, the reason uh, the reason they believe that Chicxulub in the Yucatan uh, you know where the Yucatan Peninsula is between the South America and the United States uh, the reason they think that that may be responsible for the demise of the dinosaurs is that they know uh, from other ways of dating that the dinosaurs died out about 65,000 years ago I mean 65 million years ago and the Chicxulub impact crater dates to 65 million years ago see so we not only have the, the extinction of the dinosaurs we got the smoking gun okay and uh, so could a, could a volcano like that destroy all these uh, huge beasts like we see over here 
by such absolutely absolutely uh, scientists they, they don't know it's too mammoth to, it is the, the, you know their calculations run off the board kind of but uh, they estimate the power of that impact this, this one is 150 uh, 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 nuclear bombs in, in Arizona and they estimate the power of that one at 25,000 nuclear bombs 25,000 nuclear bombs now and they think that would have created a you know a, a, a global winter you know where the the, the, uh, the the sun would have been blocked you know from all the dirt and debris and so on listen when you blow a, a hole in the ground you know a 150 mile hole in the ground you know and just billions of tons of debris come flying out uh, you know that's going to be a mess for a long time and that could have wiped out the dinosaurs now there's a bigger one yet at the tip of South Africa and there's a bigger one yet in northern Canada uh, the one in northern Canada I think is the oldest dated almost it dates to almost two billion years ago huge impact crater though uh, it's uh, I don't know 180 to 200 miles or whatever uh, uh, the, the crater is. So I mean, we're talking about we're talking about a rock, you know, 10 to 15 cubic miles, you know, of, of, of rock. No, no, not 10 to 15 cubic foot, 10 to 15 miles in diameter rock hitting the Earth at 40,000 miles an hour okay now I, I, I put in here so you have get a little bit more picture I put, I put in here uh, some pictures of these shock quartz and, and, and or, or, or uh, rock melts so you can see what it is they actually find then I have a little little thing of Chicxulub and then the, another thing that I inserted here was in the strata, it says this is the cross section of the uh, Cretaceous Tertiary boundary from Raton, New Mexico. The light colored clay layer marks the boundary and contains the impact signs such as spears of melted rock, grains of shock quartz, and a large amount of iridium. Iridium is not uh, is an extremely rare uh, element. You don't find it on Earth hardly anywhere. Uh, but it does come from meteorites. They find meteorites contain iridium. Here you have a huge layer of this stuff, and, it, and they find it different places around the world as it's as it's settled out of the atmosphere. And uh, and that there is a sure sign too. And where is that found? Right between right between the Cretaceous and the Tertiary. Okay. Let's see what else I have on that. Here are a couple more. Uh, so I have seen as believing the simple indisputable facts. If the largest impact craters were formed before man and Noah's flood was global, then all impact surface structures would have been totally obliterated or covered over by such a flood and we would not see one sign of them today but we do see that but if the largest impact craters were formed after Noah's flood then the size and magnitude of the largest ones would have so obliterated much of the human race during recorded history during recorded history poisonous gases, dust and debris and global winters would have lasted for many years causing worldwide death and extinction there's no such record of any such thing ever happening in all the recordings of men therefore the earth and large impact craters are very much older than man and there never was a global flood. There it is. How do you gain it? How do you get around that? I mean, these Dr. Austin, Dr. Baumgarten, Dr. Humphrey, they, they try to finagle, twist, and distort all the formulas they want until the cows come home. You can't get around this. I mean, I saw an impact crater myself yesterday, the day before yesterday. I know how big it is. I know uh, what destructive forces, and that was a tiny one. Uh, the Wetumpka crater is about 
three and a half miles in diameter. And some of them go up to 100 to 200 miles in diameter. Now, how many were there? We, they have now found, uh, I brought my National Geographic. The National Geographic from uh, last, uh, two months ago, I think, showed the latest findings uh, and so on. They have now found 176 impact craters on the surface of the Earth. Now, uh, young Earth uh, advocates say, well, you know, if, if the Earth is billions of years old and, uh, and you know, these meteorites were crashing in the Earth for millions and billions of years, uh, how come they don't find any uh, subterranean impact craters? They have now found, they, a few years back, they did only find two. But you have to understand, when something is buried, they even take Wetumpka, three miles, you bury it now a mile under, under the ground. Okay, just open up the ground, put it a mile under. What are the chances that anyone will ever find it? Who would ever drill a hole one mile deep under, around the town of Wetumpka, Alabama? Who? For what? So the chances are infinitesimal you would ever find one. Guess what? They do drill holes all over the world. For, for what? For oil. Do you know how many they've now found? Subterranean meteorite impact craters with shocked quartz, uh, melt balls, and all of the things that prove it was a crash. You know how many have found now? 130. If you had 130 subterranean to 176 terrestrial, and you have 300. Okay? So, does that, what does that represent of the total amount, though? 1% maybe? Yes. Why are they subterranean? In other words, they impacted the Earth a million, uh, uh, five million, a hundred million, two and a half billion years ago, and they've been over, they've been covered over. Time, you know. You see, this is again, it's a major proof of the age of the Earth. Uh, you know, it's interesting to me where you read in Genesis, you know, there was no man to till the soil, says the ground. It's soil. The word is soil. Soil is manufactured by the earth. And it takes a long, long time. You have to have volcanoes build up mountains. Then you have to have rain and wind and storm and glaciers and everything. Chew it away and grind it down to powder and distribute it in the valleys. That's soil. Now, and, and, and that, you know, so you can picture a mountain chain being disintegrated down, eroded away, and filling the valleys. Right? But what happens when they kind of get down to where everything is at an equilibrium? The earth is keep, is keep building new mountains. The, 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 uh, what begins right in this area of the country and goes all up in the New England states, the Appalachian Mountains are among the oldest mountains on earth. They think that this may have been the largest, tallest mountain chain on the planet, the Appalachian Mountains. You know, maybe reaching, uh, uh, you know, 40, 50,000 feet. They're, wa they're, they're wore down. They're wore down. They're, they're, they're just kind of smooth rolling now, you see. But the, uh, the Rocky Mountains, they have a lot of sharp, jagged edges, you know, and uplifted huge displacements of, of rock. They're, rel they're only, I don't know, I forget now, they're, they're only a couple hundred million years old. They're youngsters, see. This earth is very old. It's very, very old. Okay, but now let's just say, so, so we know of 300 meteorite impact uh, craters on and in the earth. And let's say that's only, say we found 1%. We may have found more than 1% that's on the surface because most, what they're finding now are, are more and more difficult to, to, to say for sure, see? You know, they first they go by a visual formation. And then maybe it is or maybe it isn't an impact crater, you know. There's a, the, uh, uh, what is it called, the Rise, Rise Impact Crater in Germany. There are 15 little cities that have been the crater. And this whole little mountain range around 15 miles, but just the, uh, about 15 miles. There's like 15 little towns, villages, and cities in, in there, you know, it's just scattered all around. 
And I mean, nobody ever dreamed that that's an impact crater. I mean, they've been all core drilling now, and that it, the meteorite caused that. See, but it's wore pretty much down now. See, uh, but uh, so they'll they'll be finding less and less, but they'll still still keep finding them, especially using space, uh, you know, satellite technology and so on. But what, what, the last point I want to make in all this, if these. If, 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 you know, so maybe in total there was, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, 30,000 of these uh, things that hit the earth or, or something. Say 30,000. Now you take 30,000. Oh, 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 one thing before I forget. Before I forget. Of all the subterranean impact craters they've found, of 130, only one was smaller than the Behringer Crater in Arizona. Only one was smaller. The other 129 were all larger. Look at the moon. It's covered with impact craters, right? You've got impact craters on top of impact. You see a big impact crater, right? But what you don't know is there's probably a hundred underneath it that it wiped out. And now it's got a big one. Now you get smaller ones and medium-sized ones inside the crater and inside the crater's craters and so on, you see? And the whole moon is totally pockmarked with thousands of them. The moon is tiny compared to the Earth. The Earth, the moon is smaller, so less meteorite craters would hit the moon. And number two, it has a much a smaller gravity, so less impact craters would be drawn into the moon than the Earth. So when you look at the moon, you have to understand that the Earth received many, many times more impact craters than that. And any two or three of them would wipe out, if they can't hit it all at the same time, different parts of the Earth at the same time, probably wipe out the entire population of the animal kingdom. And if there were people too. So the idea that the Earth is 6,000 years old and somehow 30,000 giant impact craters with the destructive force of hundreds of thousands of megaton uh, nuclear bombs all landed here someplace between Adam's creation and the flood because after the flood we have good documented history from all the major nations of the world. It's nonsense. Why in the world can't people see this as nonsense? All these millions of young earth enthusiasts trying to prove that God created the earth 6,000 years ago in six days and there was a global flood. Give it up! It's nonsense. There is no proof for a young earth in a global flood. None. Not one proof. None. Not only that, it's stupid and foolishness to try to come up with these theories. You've got millions and billions of tons of debris showing the strata, the impact craters. Uh, Glenn Morton, you know, the one who graduated from uh, uh, the uh, Institute for Creation Research, and then he talked about his buddies. You know, they became geologists, and when they got out in the field, you know, he said, I asked him, what, 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 did you, what is true? What, what did you learn in geology at the Institute of Creation Research? Where did, what did you learn that when you got out into the field and start working with this day to day, what did you find that is still true? Nothing! People have this giant, horrible prejudice against science, like it was, science was of the devil. I mean, this microphone, my clothing, books, computers, lights, air conditioner, automobile. This is science. This is not, this is not satanic voodoo. <laughs> Gosh, let's get our thinking straight on some of this. Are there atheistic evolutionists who try to promulgate some stupid theories? How man evolved from a rock? Yes. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about sincere, dedicated scientists who follow the scientific method, which is a very, very concise uh, uh, protocol of how you do things to establish what's true and what's not true. Are you with me? Okay. All right, that's one. <laughs> All right, now here's, here's, here's another one. I only got one page in this one. Okay. Sorry, yours is not in color. 
Uh, well, after I go through it, we all go. Uh, I think you a little mystery going here. Okay, that 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 is a supernova, an exploding star. Now scientists have known about exploding stars and novas, supernovas, you know, for many, 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 many decades. However, um, something happened in, interesting here. Uh, Uh, I'm just going to read a little of this. Last night, light arrived at your house from, a dis- from distant stars. It must have taken a long time for the light to reach your house, for the stars are very far away. The light travels 186,000 miles per second. Scientists tell us it would have taken billions of years for light to have made the journey from the distant stars. If the light did indeed come from the stars, then the life left those stars billions of years ago. It's as simple as it is. But that is a major problem for all these young earth heretics. And so, what do they do with it? They say, well, yeah, I mean, today it takes that long, but, but when God created the stars and put them out there, he created the light already here, or partway in between, or... What? I mean, what, what kind of reasoning nonsense is that? I mean, you're going to use science, but then you turn science into a miracle, which, which goes against the science that you're trying to show. It's just nonsense. Some people will object to this conclusion, and they will tell me the universe is only 6,000 years old, based on a literal, literal interpretation of the Bible. No, based on a literal interpretation of the Bible, absolutely does not show that. But if the universe and the stars are only 6,000 years old, the light appears to have taken billions of years to make the journey. How did the light manage to reach the Earth? Creationists have made several attempts to explain the problem. Some have questioned that the uh, universe is really that big. Uh, And if the stars are a lot closer, science would claim that the light would not take so long to reach the Earth, maybe 6,000 years. So So how can scientists be sure that stars are far away? Good question. Let's look at one measurement that was made on February 23, 1987. A supernova, which is a vast star explosion, was observed. It was known as SN1987A. About eight months after the explosion was observed, reflections from the explosion were seen in a distant gas cloud uh, ring that circled the supernova. The ring can be seen as the light of the as the light. Sorry. The ring can be seen as orange circle in the photo above. The reason the reflected light was delayed eight months was that it took was that it took time for the light to travel from the supernova to the distant gas cloud and then be reflected back down to the Earth. Okay. Uh, let me see. Can I can I get up here, Harry? I don't want to go to the board. Yes, no. I'm almost there now. Yeah, I'm okay, Harry. Harry, I'm okay. Are you? Yeah. Okay. Let me see what I can do here. Okay. So. How far down can you see? I'll, I'll, I'll keep it higher. Okay. Okay, I'm doing all this left hand, left-handed. Okay. This is the Earth, right? Up here, there's a supernova that explodes. Star, okay? And... Uh, there's gaseous materials out here around this thing in space. We don't know how big or whatever, but it, it doesn't circle this uh, supernova. Now, light comes from this supernova. Toward the Earth at 186,000 miles a second. Okay. Now, what happened was... In 1967, the light from that supernova reached the Earth. This man was taking place 
photographs about two three in the morning at the observatory and the, uh, the, the, he apparently didn't pay attention to the last couple photographs that were made and uh, and then he went to the dark room to develop them and one of the plates showed uh, the, the starry sky like, like he knew he was photographing it but there was this bright spot and he thought it was a a problem with the development of the uh, film, you know. But now it didn't look like a like a like a chemical problem. It looked like there was a bright light there, and he thought, "Well, what the heck is that?" It wasn't there when he was looking through his telescope, you know. And he said, "You know, that is so bright." And he, you know, these astronomers they got the sky memorized virtually. Is that so bright? I should be able to see it outside. And then he realized what happened. This 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 star, you know, was there from time immemorial. And uh, the night he took the photograph, he saw it as a supernova exploding. But it didn't explode that night. It exploded 169,000 years ago. And the light came to his observatory in February 1987. The light came to his telescope. So now this is an interesting thing. So they, they keep an eye on this. This is a... In other words, they're seeing the first light. In other words, they're looking back in history. They are actually seeing right now what happened 167,000 years ago. And lo and behold, eight months later, they see something else. Not only do they see the bright star, they now see an orange halo out around the star. So there is this gas out there. So when this star exploded, it sent its light toward the Earth. It sent its light toward outer space. Whoops, sorry. (laughs) It sent its light this way and that way in all directions. And it hit that gas. You see? And when it hit that gas, it illuminated it and reflected the light. So the light that hit the gas, they, they didn't see that circular until eight months after he first saw the explosion. Eight months later. So now we know it took eight months to go from here to here and then be reflected back to the earth. So this light traveled from here to here, this light traveled from here to here. It had to go further. See? So we got we got all the direct light, but we also got some of the light that went in other directions and was reflected back too. But it took eight months to go from here to here. So now all we need to do is a trigonomical triangulation here. From here to here is eight months, right? Back down to the earth. We can then do a triangulation. And by this we can prove that is 169,000 light years away. By simple mathematics. Simple mathematics. So you just can't deny that. You just cannot deny that. That's that star is a hundred and sixty nine thousand light years from the Earth, and therefore that star has got to be at least a hundred and ninety six thousand years old. See? But now we know that uh, it's not only 169,000 years old, 
It's been 169,000 years already since it blew up. How many billions of years old was that cloud before it blew up? Are you following me? So is the earth 6,000 years old? No. No, 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 no. There it is. Absolute proof positive. Ain't nothing these young earthers can do with it. So what will they do? They'll avoid it. They'll pretend it never happens. And say, well, we're still working on that one. <laughs> or as Ken Hosard would say, I don't, I don't think all the results are in yet. <laughs> well, Ken Hosard got ten years in the big pen to meditate on all his lies and deceitfulness. Oh, yeah. yeah. He won't be out for, I don't know, a long time. 2016 or something. 17. All right, I have one more. Huh? Come on, Ray. How did the pyramids prove that there never was a global flood and that the earth is billions of years old? How? Somebody tell me. Limestone. What? Mine the limestone down so deep to see the what no layers in it. No. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, I only came up with this one about three weeks ago. I came up with the meteorite impact crater about more than a half a year ago. But this is what I, I called Denny. Remember when I called you Denny a couple of weeks back? I said I got another one. He said what? I said the pyramids. The pyramids. Uh, uh, now, how so the pyramids? Well, because the pyramids really are pretty close to the time of the traditional date for the Noatian flood. Uh, the Step Pyramid was built in 2750 BC. Okay? And the Great Pyramid was built in 2560 B.C. And the traditional date for the flood is 2348 B.C. So the Great Pyramid is at least uh, 200 years older than the flood, or before the flood. And the, and the, uh, the, the Step Pyramid, you know, which goes like this. Um, just a little more eroded was not built as well, you know, they got better at it as they went. It's about 400 years before the flood. Okay. Now, so if there were a global flood two to four hundred years after the, the main pyramids and then of course there are numerous other ones, why are they still standing? What? It felt good, good. yeah. It good. <laughs> but we're talking about a flood that, a flood that you know, tear up mountain ranges. <laughs> Anyone else? There was no global flood. <laughs> Amen, brother. There you go. There was no global flood. Okay. So, so a couple of things here. I've got this one really bookended. Uh, not only didn't the flood wipe them away it didn't even, there's no flood damage you know what I mean there's not even any flood damage on these pyramids no flood damage and uh, you know they, they, these things are not totally watertight there have been a flood rocking around for a whole year all that seawater was seeped down in all the chambers and stuff there's no seawater down in those chambers you know, there's a lot they haven't found yet around the pyramids. The pyramids was a was a huge, a huge religious complex of buildings and canals and so on. You know, the boats came off the off the Nile River right up to the right to the pyramids. Did you know that? No, you didn't know that. Oh yeah, yeah. You drive a boat right up to the pyramids and canals, and they found this one chamber. Oh, I don't know. Thirty years ago, they found this one chamber just out from the pyramid built down in a big rock vault and they, they didn't know what was in there they did soundings and they found out it was, it was hollow there was something in there 
and they uh, they finally drilled a hole about as big as your thumb and put this, a tiny camera down. And it couldn't exactly, it was, it was a big room, you know, like as big as this room, twice as high and maybe twice as long. And uh, and finally they, uh, they, they, they opened it up and there was a dismantled ship in there. They put it together now, I think. A whole ship <laughs> dismantled and all piled up very easily in that vault. So who knows what else is all in there? But that thing was not that thing was, it was not suffering the consequences of uh, of uh, you know so many thousands of years of seawater or something being down there. Uh, so uh, so if there were a flood in 2348, it would have destroyed and are certainly badly damaged the pyramids. It did not. It did not. Nor is there any record in Egypt that there was a flood that destroyed or badly damaged the pyramids. So, I think it goes without saying there was not a global flood after after the pyramids. But yet the date of the pyramids is centuries after the pyramids. All right, now somebody suggested, well, you know, they were built good. Maybe the flood, let's say the flood... Somehow he flooded Egypt and uh, just didn't knock them down. You know, the flood rose up. Other parts carved out the Grand Canyon like a, you know, a, a million scoop shovels. But over there, it uh, maybe moved the sand around a little bit and didn't do any damage and it survived the flood, right? Now, what's wrong with that scenario? Well, if it didn't damage the scenario... I mean, if it didn't damage the pyramids, how did it lay down one to three miles of water-laid sediment underneath the pyramids? See it? Did God lift the pyramids up in the sky, totally destroy the land one to two or three miles deep, laid it back down in the course of a whole year and all these water-laid stratum, and then gently put the pyramids back on top? Either it had to totally obliterate the pyramids, which it did not, or it, we, we would have to account for all this water-laid strata, which if it came through a flood, there could not be any pyramids still standing on top of it. Can you easily see that? You cannot both preserve the pyramids from being destroyed and yet totally wipe out three miles of strata underneath it and relay it over the course of a year in all of the stratification layers we find. You cannot have both. But we have the pyramids. And we have the strata underneath. You can dig holes down under, under uh, the areas of the pyramid and you'll find the same basic geological strata comma, columns that you find everywhere else around the world. And, and, uh, and those columns are pretty much laid down by, by, by water. Not by any global flood, but at different places, different times, over millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and billions, and billions of years of tight, tight plate tectonic movement and continent movement and, and, and mountain building and erosion and so on. Billions of years, all of those layers were accumulated. Could not have been done by a flood. Absolutely was not done by a flood because we have some markers we put on top and we say, okay, if when the flood comes, let's see what they do with our markers. Oh, they're still there. Okay. So, those are three ways that you don't need to know a lot of technical stuff about anything. And you can know that this earth is millions and billions of years old and there never was a global flood. Now, there was a flood, and we're going to talk about that. It was not global. Now, one other possibility for this. Yeah, it's only the Great Pyramids 200 years off, the Step Pyramids 400 years off. What if they're all off a few hundred years? Maybe the pyramids were made a little more recent, and maybe the flood was a little more early. Okay? Possibility? Maybe the flood came before 23, 
uh, 48. Maybe it came around 27, 70 or something. Well, it had to come a lot earlier than that because it takes a long time to build the pyramids. But let's give them a 100 years to build the pyramids. You know, I mean, the flood was not 23, 48, but maybe it was uh, 27, 48. Or no, we have to push it a little further. 2800 BC. And then, after the flood, the Egyptians built the pyramids. One of the first things they did afterward, build the pyramids. So, we would have a global flood. We would have all the strata accounted for. Right? And we'd have the pyramids still intact. Right? Is there a problem with that? Yes. What? Nobody there to build them. What? There would be nobody there to build them. They would be all dead. Well, now that's a good point. Uh, to say, you know, well, Noah, let, Noah might say, you know what, I think, kids, let's get together, and we're going to start raising big families over there in Egypt. And I think in about, you know, I don't know, 500,000 years, we'll have enough laborers, we can build pyramids. <laughs> that wouldn't work, would it? Because then we have the pyramids being built about, you know, 10,044 when King David was reigning over Jerusalem. You know, it's not going to work at all. Yeah, they may work in fact. They, no, they, would, they, they, they would be building the pyramids, uh, you know, 500 years after the children of Israel were slaves down there, you know. So, yeah, there, there's no people. Who would have built the map right after? Who would have built the pyramids? There were no people. Just, and, and, and he was over Mesopotamia someplace, see? Noah and his boys. And then they built the Tower of Babel. They didn't build pyramids. There's nobody to build the pyramid. Well, let's push this thing a little further. Maybe the pyramids were built two, three, four hundred years later. It's still a problem. There's still an insurmountable problem. And I'll tell you what it is. And I got it for you in your book list. With all the archaeological and Egyptology work going on in Egypt the last 100 to 200 years, they have discovered a lot of stuff. And they have the king list pretty complete now. They have the first dynasty beginning in 3050 to 2857. The second dynasty, 2857 to 2705. And they got all the names. Horus, Abba, Horus, Tier, Horus, Wadi, they all went by that title. Mini, Itta, Etira, Kashnu, Zambaya, Ira, Nubda, Naya, Nubda, and then so on and so forth, and all the dates of their reigns. All the way through the first dynasty, second dynasty, third dynasty, which they, that, that, that is then known as the Old Kingdom, uh, dynasty four, dynasty five, dynasty six. You know, okay. Now, uh, when we come to the Old Dynasty, dynasty three, uh, Nebka the first, two thousand seven hundred and five to two thousand six hundred and eighty-seven. That's the time that the Ben Pyramid was built during his reign. Then when we come down to the fourth dynasty, which was 2630 to 2523, we have uh, 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 Khufu or, or Cheops, you know, the Great Pyramid of Cheops. And that was 2606 to 2583 he reigned. And let's say... 32 years after he began his reign, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, he reigned for 17, 23 years, but, uh, no, no, what am I doing? I, I, I'm in the wrong place. Okay, it was in the 5th dynasty and the 6th and the dynasty, okay. In, 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 in the sixth dynasty, there was a pharaoh called Pepe II, and Pepe II reigned from 2355 to 2261. Okay, how could Pepe have reigned from 2355 when seven years later there was the Noatian flood, and yet years later he's still reigning? The flood occurred in the middle of the reign of Pepe II of the 5th dynasty of the Old Kingdom, right in the middle of his reign. 
and killing, he reigned right through the front. Okay. So, um, and then I, 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 I take I take this list all the way down to 1991, Mentahapi IV, and he reigned at the time of Abraham. Now, Abraham is just this side of the flood. Okay. So if you're going to tell me that the pyramids uh, were built after the flood and that's why they weren't knocked down, what are you going to do with, with a thousand years of perfectly documented history of the kings of Egypt? And some of these kings who built Cheops built the Great Pyramid. And we know when he reigned, 2606 to 2583. That's when he built the Great Pyramid of Cheops. And the Bent Pyramid was built back in 2705 uh, under the reign of uh, Nebka I. So we know when the pyramids were built. We know who was reigning. And it's unbroken for a thousand years. How are you going to cram a thousand years of history that occurred before the flood into after the flood? Where are you going to put it? It's like we take all the history from 1750 to 1850 in the United States and try to cram it in between 1850 and 1950. How are you going to cram a hundred years of American history in there? I mean, it's just foolishness. So there's the proof. There was no flood. It would have destroyed the pyramids. If it didn't destroy the pyramids, okay, then then they would have had to build, be built after the flood. If they were built after the flood, then you can't cram a thousand years of history in there, a fully documented history. And if they survive, and if there was a flood and they survived the flood then you can't account for the two to three miles of strata underneath the pyramids. How was that water laid strata put down if, if, the pyramid, if, if the flood didn't even destroy the pyramids? How did it put down two to three miles of strata underneath the pyramids? You see? And so I say, I got this thing bookended. There's no way around it. There's the proof. That's all the proof you'll ever need. Right there in your little booklet. Yeah. Morris and Parker, you know, Morris of the Creation Museum and all that nonsense. Parker, 1987. Quote, now the geologic column is an idea, not an actual series of rock layers. Nowhere do we find the complete sequence. And you hear that from the, this is just, it's just a pipe dream of evolutionists. There's no geologic column. There's not, you know, they say it starts with the, you know, you got the down in, you know, the, the uh, pre cramery and all these different layers, the Pennsylvania and Mississippi and then all these, all these geological, you got eras and epics and, you know, it's broken down various ways. And it's only, um, it, only, uh, it only exists in the mind of these evolutionists. There is no, there's no place on earth when you can actually dig down in the ground and find all these layers. Wrong pale face. They have now found uh, dozens and dozens of places where you can find the entire. Now granted, it's not all the same everywhere. A great example is the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon starts with the, the kebab uh, uh, limestone. But and then it goes down for one mile deep to the bottom of the canyon until you hit the uh, granite. But there's two thousand feet of strata missing, so you have to go. Oh, uh, we have it. Uh, 
Oh, let's see. I thought I had that. Just a second. Oh, I, I knocked it. Wait, see if we did any damage, Eric. There it is. Uh, I wanted to reproduce some more of this stuff. I just didn't didn't have have the budget to put a thousand dollars in just the brochures and uh, you know to make them color. Okay. Now I know you you can't see this very well. But can you see there's like three sections of rock? Okay. The first section is the, uh, is the Grand Canyon. Okay. And you see how high that goes. But that's not, top, that's not the top of the ice of the Earth's geological surface. That, that, that is what, what we call the Colorado Plateau above the canyon walls. And that was wiped off. There's a couple thousand feet of strata wiped away. Then another thousand feet dug down into the channel of the, of the canyon. But if you go to other parts of the, of, the, of, the, of, of the surrounding states, in Utah and places, you'll pick up where the two stratas meet, the top strata of the canyon, and one of the lower strata is still visible in that part of the country. You go up higher again. Then you can pick up that same layer in another state, you see, and you can take it up another thousand feet or so. So, if you put it all together and you drill at an angle through the states, you know you would hit almost all of the uh, all of the uh, layers of the geologic column, even in that part of the country. Well, what happened to the strata above the surface? It's been eroded away over the millions of years and eroded away. Now, there's also the possibility that, that some layers of the column are laid down in some parts of the world and not in others because you have these shifting plate tectonics and shifting continents and, and you have various degrees of, of erosion in some part of the northern hemisphere. You have, uh, you have great glaciation, you know, and glaciers can push whole mountains of dirt and level it off. You know what now? They're finding glaciation marks in South America. You know, they, they, they think there was a time so many hundreds of millions of years ago that the entire earth became one giant snowball for, for you know, a couple million years. I have no idea how old this earth is. It's very old. When God speaks about the ancient hills, he's talking old. But, so, I, so for that stupid fraudulent argument, I have 25 locations here, around all different places around the world, all those dots, where they have found the, the complete geologic column, all ages and segments of the column. And then, Glenn Mart, uh, Morton is one of my favorite writers in this because he, you know, he really believes the Bible and... And he, and he, you know, he spent 30 years in the oil field and he knows his stuff. Here is one location in North Dakota, just one location where they drilled, drilled, did a well drilling, okay? And it has, it has all of the basic geologic stratas. Now, see, some places the strata, a certain strata may be 10 feet thick, and other places, uh, you know, 2,000 feet thick, see? But here, you know, they, they, uh, at 100 foot, they were still in the tertiary. At 4,900 feet, Cretaceous. They call it Greenhorn, then Cretaceous Maori, then Cretaceous uh, Indian Cary. you got different names for it. At 6,000 feet, Jurassic. At uh, 7,225 feet, Jurassic. Uh, 7,740 feet, the Permian, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Mississippi, Mississippi, Kibbe, Charles, Mission Canyon, so on and so forth, Devonian, 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 Silurium, Ordovician, uh, Cambrium, and Precambrium. Precambrium is before there's any, any, any kind of life forms, uh, uh, no, uh, no bacteria, nothing. Okay? So there's just one whale, has all, all those layers exactly. 
like like you'll find in uh, in different uh, charts of uh, of the geologic strata. Okay. All right. So uh, with that. We'll uh, end our first session and uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to continue on with the with the remainder of that email that I received. Okay, and a couple other points that uh, you know they're not necessary. These points are not necessarily used in mainstream young earthism, but they are used from time to time. And so. Okay, this person says, no one is saying there was not a literal seventh day, because we're already determined there was no evening and morning statement after that, so there's no reason to believe it ended. And, uh, uh, but then he says, well, no one's saying there wasn't a literal seventh day. Well, wait a minute. If there was a literal, if they mean by literal, a 24-hour period, then it would have to end with the evening and the morning because that's how every day ended, you see. But it doesn't. So the people just, you know. <clears throat> they step on their own toes. Okay, now here's an instrument. Besides all this, we have this verse of Scripture with which to contend. No, we don't have to contend with this at all. But for argument's sake, we'll contend with it. It says in Isaiah 48, 3, I have declared the former things from the beginning, he puts in all bold. And they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them. I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. Now here is Stone's definition of suddenly, and he goes into great detail about suddenly, you know, and what this word suddenly means, and where it's used in the Bible, it means suddenly, it came quickly, it happened rapidly, it goes all that extent to prove that this suddenly means very quickly, you know, from the beginning I did, I did them suddenly, quickly, you know. So, he says, it really takes a lot less faith to believe that a hen was created and that sat on her egg than to conceive some way that the hen evolved over long periods of time. All this has nothing to do with evolution whatsoever. Nothing. Don't try to tie these stupid arguments and utter foolish nonsense. People say, well, if you don't believe my foolish nonsense, then you've got to believe evolution. It has nothing to do with evolution. It's two totally different subjects. You know, how in the world do you try to string those two together? So, he says, what was that verse Isaiah 43? Isaiah 48. Let's go there. So he shows when, 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 when God created the universe, he did it suddenly. Isaiah 48. All right. I did them suddenly. Verse 3. Let's, let's go back to um, the first verse, beginning the chapter. No? Well, all else fails. Let's read it, read it in context. Hear ye this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah, which swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth, nor in righteousness. For they call themselves of the holy city, and stay themselves upon the God of Israel, the Lord of the hosts is his name. I have declared the former things from the beginning, and they went forth out of my mouth. And I showed them, and I did them suddenly, and they came to pass, because I knew that you are obstinate, and that your neck is as iron and sinew, and, and your brow is brass. I have even from the beginning declared it to you. Oh, oops, 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 oops. He thinks this is talking about the creation of the heavens and the earth. This has nothing to do with the creation of the heavens and the earth. And if you read almost any and all other translations, it doesn't even say, uh, I have declared the former things from the beginning. In other words, it makes that sound like that's uh, Genesis 1 1 talk in the beginning. He says, I, I've shown you these things from the start. <laughs> that's all it is. I've shown you these things from the start. 
And, and, and I, I, I told you these things would happen. I told you from the start these things would happen. And then when I did them, I did them suddenly. Verse 4, because I knew how you were. Verse 5, I have even from the beginning or from the start declared it unto you. Excuse me, was the nation of Israel back in Genesis 1-1? No. Did he declare these things to Israel back in the beginning? Genesis 1-1? Oh, my, I just marvel. I scratch my head in total unbelief at the absolute, absolute paramount ignorance and foolishness of such arguments. And you try to have us think. Isaiah 48 is talking about the creation of the heavens and the earth. He's talking about things that he showed he was going to do to Israel and then brought them about quickly. You know, to prove that he was behind it. And he said, and, and, and I have even in the, from the start declared it to you before it came to pass. What? These things that came to pass quickly. The creation of the heaven and the earth? No! Gosh! I mean, this is, this is, this is just a horrible thing. But everybody who reads and follows this person believes it. They would use that as an argument for you. Yes, they would. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Now, All right, here, here's one. In closing, I will also note that for any word, spiritual word, to be understood, there must first be a literal and physical shadow giving. To take the initial shadow and make it the spiritual robs us of our ability to rightly divide the word of God. What he's arguing here is... You cannot have these days, where it says day one, day two, you cannot have them represent anything that is figurative or symbolic language, meaning not a literal day, but a, an age or a long period of time. You cannot have them represent that, because this is the first we are presented with these words, days, and before a word can ever be used in a spiritual sense, it must be first shown to us what it is in the literal and the physical sense. You following me? Bull. Okay. First of all, let's notice that the first time we are presented with the word day... Is it this literal, as they call a literal day? No. They don't accept the scriptural definition of the first time day is used and how it's defined. They reject it. Why? Because they despise the word of God. They reject this here because they despise the word of God in other places. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. He divided those two. And, and God called the light day. Now there is the first literal use of the word day in the Bible. What is a day? God called the light day. Did he call the night half a day? part of a day the other half of the, the rest of the day no he called the darkness night is this too hard what is God's definition of a day light what is the first definition in Strong's Concordance day the warmth and heat of the sun during the day now can a day refer to sunset until sunset again, which would mean 24 hours? Yes. Out of 2,291 times, how many times does it do that? Almost never. And when it does, it fills in by letting you know for sure that he's talking about day and night. When Moses fasted, when Jesus fasted, his day fasted for 40 days. If 40 days means a lunar cycle of 24 hours, then that's all that needed to be said. He fasted for 40 days. But they knew the biblical, God-given definition.
definition of the word day. So when he fasted for 24 hour periods, he didn't say he fasted for 40 days. He fasted for 40 days and 40 something else. Nice. Is that clear? All right. Don't anybody ever bamboozle you with that bit of nonsense again. So, he's saying, well, you can't have these represent ages or longer periods of time, anything but a literal day. The first place where literal day is mentioned, he rejects it. Totally rejects it. Then, he says, you, you can't use anything that has a spiritual connotation before it's first used in the literal physical connotation. Oh, really? For example, he says... For example, I hope you have as much fun with this as I did. For example, Christ is called the Lamb of God. If I now take that word lamb and point out that this is a spiritual statement, does that mean that there never really was a literal physical lamb? Of course not. But that is exactly what is being done with this word day. No, that is exactly what you are doing in your stupid and foolish argument here. Let's follow it. The physical type that is first given is being denied, even being given as an original type. The claim is being made that it was spiritual in its first use. And this flies in the face of Genesis and Genesis 1, Exodus 20, Isaiah 48, uh, Romans 1.20, as well as the logic and true science and all the rest of the Word of God. Oh, really? Now, you probably forgot something that I read to you yesterday. Yesterday, I, I began reading this man's statement where he said, In the beginning... And then he gives the Hebrew word that means first fruit. See Leviticus 23.10. In Christ, God created the heavens and the earth. The first fruit. See, that's Christ. The first fruit is Christ. What does first fruit stand for there? Christ. Okay. Now, excuse me. You can't use a word in a spiritual sense till we first use it in a physical, literal way? Were they farming in Genesis 1-1? Did they bring in the first crop of the year and call it the first fruit? And then we're told that the, that the universe was created by Jesus Christ, the first fruit? Whoops, oops, <laughs> oops. So here we have him telling us that Christ, this first fruit, means Christ. But we didn't have any first fruits yet, not literal first fruits. We don't have first fruits till the 23rd chapter of Leviticus. The first place the word first fruits is used Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus. Oops, shot myself in the foot there, I guess, huh? Or this person did. You see, I, it, it isn't just that he said this is another point to consider. The physical type is first given as being denied. You know, if you say that these days can be longer than 24-hour literal. A day is not a 24-hour literal. That's not a literal day. A literal day is the light. Okay. Uh, the physical type that is first given is being denied, even being given as, a, as an original type. The claim is being made that it was spiritual in its first place. And this flies in the face of Genesis 1, Exodus 11, Isaiah 48, Romans 1, as well as the logic and the true science and all the Word of God. Wow. And what did he just do? He just shot himself in the foot with his own words. Your own words shall condemn you. Okay. Now, I, I wanted to go through some of that stuff because... You know, this, this email started out. Maybe, maybe this will help you understand. Maybe this will help you believe the Bible, right? <laughs> so, anyway. All right, we're through with that. Now we're moving on to Noah's flood. We're going to go through the flood here. Oh, and you, no, I got way too much material for the flood. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. 
So, and I left hundreds of more pages at home. But let me see what I'm going to do here. Uh, I'm going to use that. Some of these, I, I just folded them open to one or two things I want to use. Straits and all of that. I don't think I'll go through that. You know, where trees grow up through supposedly different layers and so on. Okay, here, here's one. I'm just going to make. The, here's one point. Uh, and, and and not that this is of such great significance, other than that there are thousands of such things. Here's just one. When the European priests first entered the arid northwestern United States, they found vast tracts of land with cobbles, dark on the top and light on the underside. They returned the stones, they, they turned the stones over, making huge light-colored crosses in the desert out of these stones. They were dark on top, light on the bottom. They turned them over, used the light side, made crosses out of them. In the intervening 300 years, the crosses are still visible but are now beginning to fade. It has taken 300 years for the microbes to cover the stones, the upper surfaces, with a type of varnish. But this is a background, which is one to conclude when we find the same type of varnish coatings in the pre-Permian. We find the same varnish coatings in Permian sand grains in the uh, Zaxstein of the North Sea. Okay, the Permian rocks are from the very, the very middle of the supposed flood deposited rocks of Noah's flood. This should be the time of the maximum flooding of the earth. Yet here we find desert varnish which requires at least 300 years to form on these rocks in this strata, in the middle of the flood. Okay? Not only this, sand grains which are coated with this slow forming film are found in sharp and sand, and sand dunes alike. Clearly this evidence shows there was at least 300 year interval in the middle of the flood. This is something that Earth, young Earth creationists never will tell you. Now, that's what is one thing. They face hundreds of things like that. And, and by the time this thing is studied and hashed over for another 50 or 100 years, there will be thousands of things that just totally fly in the face of this silly idea that there was a global flood a couple thousand years ago. Okay, what do we have here? According to the Nova Scotian Department of Environment, when waters reach 6.0 pH, the insects, crustaceans, and some plankton disappear. When water reaches 5.5 pH, that's very acid, uh, mosses and unwanted plankton invade the waters and some fish disappear. But when the water goes below 5.0 pH, nearly all the fish die. So a global flood in which just a small fraction of the volcanism on the continents occurred during a single year would result in the ocean being total devoid of all life. See, they have, they have problems that they have to contend with. Uh, how do you account for all these volcanoes, you know? Oh, they, 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 during the flood, there's thousands of volcanoes going off. Oh, really? Number one, it would have raised the temperature of the water, probably evaporated it all. And uh, Noah had a tough time in that arc if there were eruptions worldwide by the hundreds. And it would poison the water. Nothing could live. See? Every time they come up with a solution, they create ten problems. Okay, uh, let's see here. All right. Uh, yeah, pull this up. Okay. All right. Some of the problems with the flood. Okay. 
The longest wooden ships in modern seas are 300 feet. The, the ark was 450 feet. Uh, the only way a ship could uh, sustain any kind of turbulent water would be as if it was steel reinforced. You can't, you cannot make a wooden ship 450 feet long that will survive rough seas. Will not. It's just physiologically impossible. It's too much stress over too large an area. It will not hold. You must have a steel in a reinforcement if you're making out of, out of wood. So, number one, the boat certainly couldn't have been any bigger than that. And uh, uh, number two, there couldn't have been really violent, turbulent water. The purpose of the ark was to float, not to be able to uh, navigate hurricanes, volcanoes, and all of that kind of nonsense. It just floated while God destroyed everything in, in the land. Could animals have traveled from, from elsewhere? Some, like sleuths and penguins, can't travel over land very well. Some, like koalas and insects, require special diets. Some cave-dwelling anthropods can survive in less than 100% relative humidity. Uh, uh, some, like dodos, must, must live on islands. Could the animals have all lived near Noah? Some creations suggest the animals traveled to reach the ark. A moderate, a moderate climate could have made it possible for them to live a long time. However, this proposal makes matters even worse. The point above would have applied not only to island species, but to almost all species. Uh, this is the reason why. Gila monsters, yaks, and Hutal calls, I don't know what that is, don't live uh, together in a temperate climate. Most extinctions are caused by dis most extinctions are caused by destroying the organisms preferred environments. So now we're going to do that's how they die. You take them out of their environment. Now we're going to take all the animals of the world out of their environment to preserve them. No, you'll kill them. You'll kill them. They can't live like that. Uh, how was the ark loaded? Noah had only seven days to load the ark. If they only had 15,764 15, animals uh, on the ark, uh, one animal would have had to be loaded every 38 seconds. Mm -hmm. What is the kind? The creationists themselves can't decide on an answer to this. They propose a criteria ranging from species to order. And I haven't seen an entire kingdom like bacteria suggested as a single kind. Wood morapi uh, uh, compromises by using genus as a kind. However, on the ark, kind must have meant something closer to a species. Why? Why were they taken on the ark? To preserve them alive. So if they were taken on the ark to preserve them alive, they had to be able to breed. And many uh, animals that seem somewhat related are not of the same species. They can't breed. If they can't breed, you can't preserve them alive. Harry, would you would you would you bring that chart over here for me? Maybe this is a good place to introduce this. Yes, uh, just bring the whole stand. Yeah, that's easier, easier said than done, right? Okay, you did good. All right, that's good. Right, that's good right there. Yeah. And uh, you know, we have the problem of putting the dinosaurs. You know, this is a dinosaur. Does it look like this? This is a dinosaur. Does it look like this? This is a dinosaur. Does it look like this? I mean, you can take two dinosaurs. Dinosaur is, is a huge kingdom of animals, right? Now, they have discovered approximately to date 700 species. That means ones that can breed with each other, but not, you know, one species can breed with each other, but not with other species. This cannot breed with this. If you want to preserve all these animals, you need two of these, 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 and you need 
at least a thousand of those times male and female two thousand now you begin to see even a little problem with putting two thousand dinosaurs on the ark you see a little problem with that two thousand of those these things weigh almost a hundred tons so they took babies you know these type of, of four footed animals usually grow to, to nearly adult size in one year you ever see a one year old cow it's bigger than a one day old calf a lot bigger so they think there's got to be at least a thousand of these species that they know of 700 but this shows how diverse they are and on the flip side where the glued down you'll never see it again these are from the northern hemisphere on the flip side it has the dinosaurs found in the southern hemisphere and they're all different from these there are many 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 of them how do you get them on the ark how do you feed them how do you keep them from fighting and while we're at it where do the dinosaurs fit in the, the Bible? Okay. All right, there's one place I think they fit. It's interesting, there's only three things that God said He created. He created the heavens and the earth, He created man and woman, and He created the great Nadine. Okay, which the Bible translates uh, whales. A lot of newer translator, translations have it like important monsters. He created great monsters. They look like monsters, don't they? Okay. Now, uh, in the Hebrew, Tainim and Tainim, uh, they say it's a marine or land monster. That is a sea serpent or jackal, dragon, sea monster, serpent, or whale. Okay. So they do have it down as a as a serpent. This is a strong. Okay. But in Exodus seven, verse nine. Uh, we read of a serpent and it's the fo- it's the form of the word tainin actually it is tainin and in Exodus 7.15 it plainly tells us that this tainin was a number 51.75 of a now quouch now quouch which is a snake it's a snake so we know that the Tainin were in the snake family. Or the snake family was in the Tainin family. Or that a snake can also be called a Tainin, which is a, uh, which is a, a, a reptile. And in Genesis uh, 121, it says, God created the great Tainin. Okay? Can you see why he would use the word great? Huh? The only place in the Genesis creation we use the word great one time only. The great tiny. And then I was saying those of you were not how many were on a little chat last night? Pretty many there. About half a third of you. I was saying how I was laying in bed one night and I got to thinking about uh, I think about this stuff all day long. <laughs> I'm thinking about uh, how God said, you know, He He told the man, uh, He told the first uh, people that He made there in verse twenty-six, twenty-seven. Uh, he told them to uh, 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 have uh, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over all the creatures on, that move on the earth. I can think, wait a minute, wait, 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 what's missing here? What's missing here? Back here. Back here in Genesis it says, and God said, let the waters swarm abundantly with the moving creatures that have life and the fowl and, and, and so on, you see. Uh, so he made the, the, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and then and then on the next day before he made Adam and Eve he, or not Adam and Eve he made the first uh, humans we're not sure that, that was Adam and Eve Adam comes along in chapter 2 and then it says God made the beasts of the earth and he made the cattle and, and all the creeping things and so on so we have the, uh, the fish of the sea the birds of the air and, and the creeping things and cattle on the earth right and then he says uh, after he made 
the humans. He said, you shall have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the creepy things uh, of the earth, right? What happened? Why didn't have to dominion over the great Tainin? I mean, this is the this is the thing he calls great of all the animals and birds and fishes. The one thing he calls great is the great Tainin. Why didn't he say have dominion over the great Tainin? They were dead for sixty-five million years. That's why there were no great Tainin when the humans were made. That's why they didn't have dominion over them. Or they had dominion over them along with the fish and the birds and everything else. You see, the fish and the birds and everything, they survived down to the creation of humanity. The great Tainin were no longer there. That's why they couldn't have dominion over them. Okay? All right, we'll leave that. All right. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, one other point that just popped in my mind regarding this, and that is. These things live by the millions and millions and millions on the face of this earth. Millions of these dinosaurs lived. And of course, the, uh, you go to these, uh, these fraudulent creation museums and they'll have you think they'll have children playing with dinosaurs or riding on their backs or whatever. And uh, yet they know there are no dinosaurs today. They all know that. Now, even though Ken said, "Well, no, there was a Pleistosaur that the Japanese fit. no, no, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a whale." But anyway, but they know there are no dinosaurs anymore. How do they account for that? How do they account for that? Well, they were killed in the flood. That's why there are no dinosaurs today. They're all killed in the flood. Excuse me. Do you see a problem with that? Do you see a problem with that? They were all killed. That's why you don't have them. Of course, God wiped them out in the blood. He didn't like the looks of them. He said, I don't even bring those back anymore. <laughs> but there's a problem. What's the problem there? They couldn't have got them on the water. Well, but even if they could have, you still have a problem. Why well, we ain't got none now? Yeah. Where are they good? All right. So they have no answer for that. They died out probably from the Chicxulub impact crater that caused a, a nuclear winter, and, and they all died except small mammals and people, things that could crawl in holes and somehow survive a year or so too. So they say, oh well, we got the perfect answer for that. Why did not kill them in the flood? Excuse me. What was the purpose of the ark? To preserve. To preserve the animals. Double talking lying frauds, all of them. How can you take them on the ark to preserve them and have the flood kill them all? You can't have it both ways. If they were taken on the ark to be preserved, then they would have lived after the flood and be preserved. They would have at least had to live the first couple thousand years or so. And we don't have one example of a human being with a dinosaur. So any way they slice it, they fail. Any way they slice it, they fail. If they died in the flood, then they died. God didn't do what he said the purpose of the ark was. To preserve, to have a male and female of every animal to preserve it. Okay? It's a major point, actually. Why did the Lord make them? Why? I don't know. <laughs> and I'll tell you what else I don't know. Why did he take so long to do all this? Don't know. I mean, I have some ideas, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put, put those out until I have a couple more years to meditate on it. Is that when we get our old and some of the dinosaurs? 
Uh, what? No, no, I don't think so. No, no. Amen. Glory to God. Now, now, don't get me wrong. There, there are similarities between oil and coal. Coal, uh, coal does come from vegetation. Uh, you know, over in Georgia, we have the great Okefenokee Swamp, for example. Okay, and what? the Okefenokee Swamp. Well, that swamp, that swamp will be a coal vein one day. You know, as it gets pressed down and more and more in heat and pressure, that will be a giant coal vein. So coal can come from vegetation. But there's some problems with this. We got a break. There's a problem with this. Uh, even in the so 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 uh, the flood people would. I mean, the, the, the young Earth global flood people would have you believe that. Uh, during the flood, all the massive forests and, and, and vegetation were like swept together and then, and then buried under the strata someplace, some deeper, some not so deep, and so on. And this is what is now our coal deposits. And sure enough, coal does come from decayed vegetation under time, heat, and pressure, and all of that. But there's a major problem with it. That is how coal was formed, but not in one year. Not in the not in one year of the flood. There is so much coal under the earth, and some pretty close to the, in this world, that if it all came from the vegetation available at the time that the flood started, the earth would have had would have had vegetation so thick you couldn't stick your finger through it a mile high. One year's, in other words, whatever amount of vegetation and trees and forests you find in the, on the earth in any one given year, if you took all of it, scooped it together, pressed it down, and into coal, it wouldn't be a fraction of the amount of coal that is in the earth. Are you following that? Okay. Now, the oil. The oil has always been called a fossil fuel. Do you know why? I've always agreed. Why? Because of greed. Because of greed. No, no, why do they call it a fossil? Well, they claim, they claim they've been studies and all back years ago. I remember when I was real small, they claimed it come from the, the same, right. the same dinosaur car. Right. Okay, again, we have the same problem. Suppose we say, all right, it comes from dinosaurs. So you take all the dinosaurs that are alive at one given time when the flood hit, okay? Now maybe, of course they say, they say no, nothing died until the flood. So all the millions and millions and millions and millions of dinosaurs that they have, know are in the ground and that they are finding around the world, young earths would tell you they were all alive at the same time, virtually, you know, within that short period of time before the... No, no, all at the same time, yes, because nothing died. So every dinosaur ever born and had babies and their babies grew up and had babies and grew up and had babies for almost 2,000 years were all alive yet at the time of the blood. You would have animals 300 feet deep around the entire globe. It's nonsense. More. But even if you took that they die off and there's only so many alive at any given time, so you take all the dinosaurs and all the animals and all the trees and everything, anything organic, and you kill it and squish it all together at the time of the flood. Everything that's available during that one period. Squish it together at the time of the flood. You would not have one fraction of the amount of oil. Now we use it one day, bro. <laughs> we, so we would use up that one, that, that amount that would have been killed on that day, we would use that up in a week. Amen. Now, there's more. There's more. Down in the Gulf of Mexico, there's a place called the Eugene Island. It's a just little island place where they drill for oil. And uh, they struck oil there about uh, 20 years ago or whatever, and they're pumping at about 20,000 barrels a day. Okay? 
It pumped, 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 pumped. 20,000 barrels a day. And it went down to 10,000 barrels a day. Finally, it went down to about 3,000 barrels a day. They think, well, we're about finished here, right? Now, what do you think happened? It's all here. You start filling up. <laughs> it start filling up to 10,000 barrels a day again. So, the oil companies involved in the federal government had matching grants of $5 million, either $10 million or something like that. And they sent geologists and, and, and sea divers and explorers, and, and they went down there and they started doing all kinds of experiments. And they said, what the hell is going on here? You know? And they found out that there is new oil coming in to fill the, the reservoir that they had drained out. And, uh, you know, so they saying, you know, the, the, these are not renewable sources of energy. Well, they well may be, okay? But now, uh, so why do they call these things fossil fuels in the first place? Because they find bacteria in oil, okay? At least some oil. They find bacteria. That's proof that this was once alive. There's bacteria there. The truth of the matter is they're finding bacteria thousands of feet in the ground. I don't know just how it got there or gets there, but there is bacteria thousands of feet in the ground. About three or four years ago was the first I heard of this. A Russian scientist said, I don't think oil comes from organic source. He says, and I don't either. I'll tell you where oil comes from. The earth makes it. That's what I say. The earth makes it. The earth makes its own oil. The earth makes its own gold. The earth makes its own diamonds. The earth makes its own silver. The earth manufactures it inside and spews it out. The earth is like a living organism. It's like a giant manufacturing concern. It manufactures everything that's on the earth came out of the earth. I don't care if it's sulfur or a diamond. It came, the earth made it. Amen. The earth made it. So I think earth makes oil. Now, one last point, and we'll take a break. The Russians, now we've had some deep wells. You know, I knew Chevron was drilling wells 18,000 feet deep. That's pretty deep. 18,000 feet deep. The Russians are now drilling or pumping oil at 40,000 feet. Have you ever been in an airplane where you took a long country trip where they fly as high as they go, 40,000 feet? How many? Where you can hardly see an interstate, it looks like a person's hair. They're drilling oil at 40,000 feet, eight miles. Can you imagine that Noah's flood? I'm glad somebody brought this up because this is an interesting. I have one of can you imagine Noah's flood churning the earth up eight miles deep and depositing uh, uh, trees and dinosaurs to turn into oil eight feet, uh, eight miles under the surface? I said, well, maybe, maybe it was higher and it seeped down. No, oil floats. Okay, let's take a break.